Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right. Today's discussion is on India and the War Horse evolution, economics, and tactics with Abhijit Ayer Mitra. So I'll just give you guys brief background as to what we are going to be doing. So this is part two of our earlier invasion uh, discussion on the Turkic invasions in India. So Abhijit. Uh, had decided that we're going to make it at a two part discussion so today's discussion is going to be a presentation from abhijit uh, abhijit normally is not uh, a powerpoint uh, guy so this one uh, is special so abhijit thanks for coming veil veil vetri veil and thanks for having me on all right so abhijit uh, do i uh, do i put the ppt on the screen or you want to make a a, a, a brief uh, introduction and then get into the ppt jaise theko karna bol हाँ ठीक है सो द इंट्रोडक्शन वॉज दैट आई रियलाइज वेन वी डिड द तुर्किक इन्वेजन थिंग हाउ मेनी पीपल वेर एक्चुअली क्लूलेस अबाउट द हॉर्स राइट द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉमेंट वॉज देखो भिमबेटका में हॉर्स था हमारे पास हॉर्स था हमको सब कुछ पता था हमारे पास फाइव थाउजेंड बी सी में बोइंग सेवन एट सेवन था विथ जी नाइनटी इंजिन और हम जेट इंजिन चला रहे थे so you know just to correct a lot of this uh, sort of uh, uh, ethno nationalist uh, 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 projected history we decided to do this particular part because it turns out most people don't understand what a horse is even you know they've read debates on true horse and not true horse in arappa and they still don't get it they also don't get how horses evolved and how horse warfare uh, evolved and if they do they think they do and it's all based on you know sergey eisenstein's battle on ice you know that sequence of the battle on ice uh, from alexander nevsky it sort of become the template for everything every battle sequence involving horses since then militaries did not fight like that okay uh, uh, um, and uh, horses definitely didn't charge the way you see there and you know the lord of the rings may in that last final scene where they charge outside that this thing it absolutely never happened that way uh, there there is a lot of uh, 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 textual evidence of that so you know the problem is these people they watch mahabharat ramayan which never had very good battle scenes uh, or they watch these better made uh, western movies and they think that this is how things happened they did not so one of the things we're going to do today is for you to see all the problems with the horse the problem of even ascribing a true horse to india there's actually a genetic lock out there which we'll come to right at the end and to look at tactics and how horses evolved so to give you this is basically giving you a true picture of the horse and well marginally about why it never worked in india why we were never able to combat the horse in india So let's get to slide one. All right, let me put it up for everyone. All right, size. ठीक है ना? Now, I want everybody to look at the leftmost slide. अरे पहले before this बात. Yeah. Yeah. Get off yeah. 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 No, it's there. It's, it's there. It's there. ठीक. Don't worry. हाँ. तो आ हाँ. So, if you look at the horse on the left, that is your typical Mongol horse. In fact, that is taken somewhere outside Oymyakon, uh, which is the coldest part on Earth, and which we think that particular channel, uh, it it gets to minus sixty three degrees in winter because it uh, sort of funnels in Arctic air and pushes it down all the way into northern China, and. surprisingly that is the particular channel that uh, you know directly leads to the eastern steppes which are these lush green more or less even uh, 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 grasslands where things grow now this is what the original horse used to look like this is a a, a modern mongol horse but it's one of the few horses uh, that hasn't really evolved the other horse that hasn't evolved is the preswalski's horse uh but these are almost undiluted every other horse breed on earth has been corrupted by human breeding right now look at the size of the man compared to the horse the mm-hmm. guy is a good 1 foot taller than the horse mm-hmm. right 
Now you look at the second image of the girl in pink with the horse. I've yep. got that off her riding side. She's actually quite tall. She's apparently six foot something. You look at the size of that horse there. Right yep. now, look at the difference between the Mongol man standing in his uh, on his horse about uh, uh, one foot taller than the horse, and this lady standing in front of a uh, modern, genetically, uh, you know, eugenically uh, uh, created horse. These kind of horses start appearing around the uh, 13th century. 12th 13th century thereabouts and uh you you can see the size difference that has happened which is the third image yeah. you look at the relative heights out there that is the uh, uh bacha horse and that is the uh, well that is the original horse and the shadow at the back is the new uh, uh well the new new money about thousand year old varieties of horse 800 900 year old varieties of horse next slide please Now, see the problem with this is why is this important? Because you know in Harappa there's this big uh, controversy: is this the real horse or is this not the real horse? True horse or not the true horse? Now, ranking if it is a true horse or not becomes highly problematic because remember at that point of time all the horses were small horses. They're smaller than what you would call a pony today. In fact, they were little bigger than donkeys, at best. They were only slightly bigger than donkeys, uh, 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 to be sure. So given that all horses were only slightly bigger or the same size as donkeys, we have huge problems determining what is actually an equus cabalis and what is an equus asinus. That is to say donkey or a horse. It becomes very, very problematic, uh, especially given the species that were there. Now, if you look at the image here on the left, that is an, a modern depiction of an Assyrian war chariot. Okay. Now, the problem with this depiction is it's all wrong. And unfortunately, this is what you will see in history books, in illustrated history books like Dorking and Kindersley and all those things. This is what you'll see. The horse is too big. The chariot is too big. And there has never been a chariot of that size found relative to the human beings in it. Okay. Uh, mostly to do with the height. You do actually have three and four man chariots. But those kind of chariots, impossible to find. Now, what they've found is digging in Sumerian graves. Now, the thing, the ease with which we can uh, say about Sumer, and after that it becomes problematic, is because after the Bronze Age, you don't really have burial goods, right? Uh, like after Bronze Age in the Iron Age, all the burials, most of the burials are done without sacrificing horses and servants and things like that, or burying them alive with the Lord and Master. But in Sumeria, we've actually been able... To, so this is one of the friezes from... Uh, I think this is uh, uh, Uruk. Uh, this is one of the friezes from Uruk. And that is a reconstruction of that exact same frieze from Uruk. And you can see it's almost like a children's toy. And we can actually confirm from archaeological digs that this is what it actually looked like. It's like a little cart... It's almost like a baby's cart. Two people hardly fit in there. And it's a, a string of about four horses uh, 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 taking it uh, along. Right. Now, very, very important. Why are we discussing size? Because these horses were so small. They couldn't hold people on their backs. At this point of time, you absolutely could not carry a rider on your back. There is... a uh, there are some mentions of people being carried on the back, but that is mostly old, frail people who are very thin, very small, very light and things like that. The kind of loads we're talking about were impossible to carry uh, uh, in those days, which is why you had a chariot. They could draw, but they could not carry because remember, it is. we'll see this later when we study the bone structure. It's a very uh, uh, slender bone that you can't really uh, uh, carry on. Next slide, please. It's on okay. Abhijit. Yeah, I can see. Uh, so, isme kya hai ki this is your, uh, this is the first proper Iron Age documented horse uh, that we know about. This was in Pompeii. Uh, this horse and its rider were killed by the magma flow uh, during the eruption of Vesuvius. 
and you can see from the guys sitting next to it exactly how small this horse is now from sumeria which was about 2000 years back to this time there's been zero evolution in the size of horses but what we do know is that the backbone of this particular horse was significantly strengthened now we know it's sometime in the iron age only around the earliest depiction of a man riding a horse is an assyrian depiction from about 800 uh, bc so we know from that time they were able to ride a horse but very very carefully you couldn't wear armor you couldn't wear full body armor the weights were extremely weird and the size of the horse didn't increase though the back strength of the horse clearly did right so this is something between contrast we've been able to uh, study quite clearly next slide please now this is also something you see today this is for comparison uh people riding these horses this is exactly how these horses would have looked i know these look like children riding horses no they're actually grown people riding horses and you can see this this is a mosaic of a roman horse rider and you can see exactly what the proportions are these i mean these horses they're basically like great danes they would literally be the size of a great dane dog not more right and you can see that they're very likely of course this is meant to be a race uh, a horse thing but there's also examples of this in war mosaic so if you come to the next one next slide it's up abhi okay. the leg ratio one yeah so on the left the leg ratio i want you to see so the left the uh, this is a reconstruction of a mosaic found in a roman villa but it's alexander defeating uh, 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 darius at the battle of issus uh, it's a very famous mosaic and the leg part was completely damaged but if you look at alexander's leg on the extreme left you see how much of it was hanging down if you look at the legs the entire shoe the entire upper part of the boot is actually below the uh, stomach of the horse right and at this point you can clearly see this is around what 350 bc or something like that you can clearly see that uh, 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 they were able to ride horses but you also look that alexander's armor is extremely light right uh, on the right is about uh what uh 1400 years down the line this is from the bayou tapestry uh which is the tapestry that was made by the queen of england and her maids to celebrate the 1066 norman conquest of uh uh britain now look what you see again it's the same ratio of the boot the boot is still dangling a significant amount down from the belly of the horse hmm. which shows you that they were still pretty damn small animals they still hadn't grown big so you know you look at all these hollywood old hollywood knights in armor uh, things you see these big horses they weren't that big they were actually tiny okay they were literally like big great danes uh, you were riding a great dane to war but also notice look at the difference between the armor alexander is wearing there and the armor that these guys are wearing they're wearing wearing fish scale armor which is metal plates put on top of the other and there's a reason for it because by this time they had plate armor but plate armor was too heavy to be worn so they needed lighter armor they would wear either chain mail or fish scale armor which was much lighter to put together and that and it was done for a reason because the horse had to be kept light so we know that even now even at this point the horse isn't that strong right but there's something very significant here if you look on the left you will see alexander does not have a saddle he's riding on a blanket right he's put a blanket at the back of his horse and he doesn't have stirrups that is the hooks that the people's legs are in whereas on the right if you look the red boots they are actually in a stirrup which is to say the foot the foot hooks theek hai na 
and the it seems like saddles but you can tell from the way it's curved it's not a blanket it's actually a saddle even though it looks like a uh, uh this thing uh next uh slide please it's up now this is from the 1250s and this is the first time the first time in medieval uh uh depictions i want you to check where the feet of the guy are you look at the feet of the knights on the left which is clearly visible it no longer falls below the belly anymore and this now becomes a standardized depiction throughout the legs no longer dangle below the belly of the horse so we know at some point between 1066 ad and these are both french this one is french the bayeux tapestry is well in those days britain was france so it's kind of like french and french uh from 1066 to 1250 you've seen the size of the horse has increased all of a sudden standard increase because at this point the depiction of the leg being level with the belly or in fact slightly higher than the belly increases quite significantly so what has happened is you've seen a significant within a period of about 100 to 150 years you've seen this sudden jump in the size of cavalry we don't know why this happens but we know it happens and isn't it curious it's around about the same time we know that this change this jump in cavalry starts somewhere in central asia and moves westwards very very rapidly and what happens here is remember when the second battle of tarain is first and second battle of tarain 1192 it's happening around the same period the change in the cavalry the turks used in india the size would have expanded very rapidly very very quickly so it would have been almost uh, uh, immediate uh, right so remember this is a very critical time period we don't know how or why because the documentation is non existent for this but we know from artistic depictions that the size of these horse completely changes now this has been the size evolution now i'm just going to leave this here i'm going to leave this very disjointed because you will see why this is important remember this period here 1066 and the battle of hastings which you saw in the previous slide to about 1250 is when there is a sudden and dramatic change in the size of the horse uh keep this at the back of your mind because 1192 to 1250 1300 is the prime period for all your turkic invasions into india uh this is where uh, uh, ghori comes uh and remember ghazni was defeated but ghori was uh undefeated and from ghori onwards we were never able to defeat them for a way you know the assamese were able to defeat them and the odias were able to defeat them for a, a while uh we'll discuss that maybe in a later episode or something like that but um uh, that was for a very peculiar set of reasons but remember this is the period where the horse changes everything in india at least theek hai na next slide please okay now you'll be wondering why i'm showing you a manual gearbox versus an automatic gearbox it's because of the innovation that goes around the horse okay and that's a very very important thing people don't realize this they think bhai kisi ne ek belt laga liya ek din aur ek din stirrup laga liya aur ek din ja ke uske upar saddle rakh diya and things happen no these things required a lot of thought these were the ancient equivalents of extraordinary precision engineering that required a lot of thought and it was slow innovations that built up over thousands and thousands and thousands of years now why am i showing you an automatic gearbox versus a manual gearbox now for those of you who have driven you will know well it looks the same right it's just a lever and a lever but the difference is in a manual gearbox you have to keep shifting gears every now and then unless you're driving on a highway in an automatic you don't you just put it into drive and that's it you're driving unless you want to play these stunts with your uh, you know f1 gear shift and all that nonsense you're just driving the only difference is your foot pedal the clutch 
there is no clutch in an automatic on the right. There is a clutch in the uh, manual on the left. And yet across the world, insurance study after insurance study after insurance study has shown that just the removal of the clutch, one action, the clutch, has reduced accident rates by 80%. Wow. 80%. Just one change. Why? Because you've trained your body to work like this. It is not natural functioning of the body to have clutch and hand shifting at the same time. Right. So keep this in mind. If one change from manual to automatic has improved road safety that much, when you look at the accretion of changes I'm going to show you, they are very, very significant. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this, these two, the left one is a tetradrachmo of uh, the Seleucid period. I want you to look at how this guy is riding his horse. His legs are almost clutching the horse up front. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, the coin on the left, uh, the left part of the left coin, where there's the guy riding the horse. He's almost clutching the horse with his legs. On the right, this is from the Take Bostan. This, uh, unfortunately, the pictures I took at the Take Bostan didn't come out very well. So this is a stock standard internet picture. Uh, this is around 500 to 600 AD. And you look how the king there, that is Khusro. And that's a very famous horse of his called Shabdiz. Uh, you look how he's clutching his horse when he's extending his spear. He's literally bending forward and holding on for dear life to his horse. Now, there's a horse riding manual we know of from Greece from around 300 AD. It's from the Alexandrian period. Where they tell you riding is like standing upright on your thighs. Because remember, you had no place to rest your feet. Your feet were dangling. There was no belt under the horse to uh, hold that blanket that you'd put at the back of the horse down. So, you know, uh, it was just the back of the horse, a, a kind of heavy-ish blanket on top to uh, cushion the back of the horse somewhat. And then you were sitting on top of it. Your only way of holding the horse was with your thighs. Can you imagine galloping at 20 kilometers per hour? Holding your thighs. And you know, people seem to think because of Bollywood, Hollywood movies, that riding a horse is just like you sit on a horse and the horse rides. You'd be nuts. It is such an extraordinary physical activity. Every time I've ridden a horse, I haven't been able to walk for like six, seven days after that. And mind you, this is with all the modern technology. You look like you've come out of some horrible, uh, you know, uh, 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 group sex video where you've gotten banged over God knows how many times kind of thing. <laughs> uh, it it's, it's extraordinarily strenuous, even with all the modern technology you have on a horse. A and, you know, I'm actually using the word modern technology. You might be thinking, what the hell is this boy talking about? But it is. Now, remember, in this period, the only way of controlling the horse was with your hand. You don't know if you're going to stay on top of the horse or not because the blanket that you're using to cushion it could fall off. You're holding on for dear life with your thighs onto the horse. Okay. And on top of this, you either have to shoot arrows or pierce somebody with a lance. Now, you remember that uh, a visual we showed you of the automatic versus manual gear shift? Mm-hmm. 80% reduction in accident for just one action removed. Hmm. Here you are doing five, six actions at the same time. You are navigating. You are trying to use your spear or your bow and arrow to kill the enemy. You're holding on for dear life with your thighs to your horse. Okay. You are guiding the horse with your, uh, 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 with the uh, uh, bite around its uh, mouth. Understand the amount of training that went into this. It was always a prestige symbol. Only kings and generals rode it. 
And in fact, for a very long time, you look at uh, Rome or Greece. Greece, remember, Alexander used to finish the victory with his horse, but he never won the victory with his horse. The victories were won using the phalanxes, the ground troops. You look at all the great Roman uh, emperors, not one of them was a cavalry general. They were all infantry generals. Because this is a time where infantry was the king. The horse was supplementary to the battlefield. Okay, It was used to, I, we'll talk about this in the tactics, then you'll understand why I'm saying this. Uh, to the next uh, thing, please. So this was the grip issue, which becomes very problematic. Next slide. Okay. So the first uh, big innovation that happens, this is around, sorry, it, I say, it says 1 BC. It should actually be 100 BC. 100 to about 150-ish uh, BC. Uh, see, that is the structure of the horse, you can see. And this is the saddle. This is a modern saddle. It isn't an old saddle. Now, what happens in this is, you see the slender where that yellow sign is. That is the back of the horse. It's very delicate. Like everybody, human beings, gorillas, four-legged animals, two-legged animals, the spine is the most delicate part of your body. So what this saddle does is it transfers much the same way that pillars transfer away energy, the downwards pressure, it channels it and then pushes it away. What this saddle does is it transfers. Can you see that hump where the red two red lines intersect? It transfers a lot of the weight exactly. It transfers a lot of the weight into the hump and then down to the front legs. So if, you, uh, if you've got your friend by you or if you're sitting by you, take a small, it's very simple. Would you feel comfortable being on all fours and carrying something on your back or rather carrying something on your shoulders? Right, that is why you have shoulder straps for bags and things like that. So this transfers a lot of weight to the shoulder muscles. I, I'll show you the muscle structure. It happens in a very different way, but this is a huge innovation. Uh, next slide, please. Now, to understand what it is, is I want you to look at the bone structure on the left of the horse. Now, you see the right. This, is, this was the only image I could find of a human bone structure atop a horse bone structure. See the horse ribs. They're literally like kathalke fruit. They're literally like spikes sticking out. And they're going right up your ass. Because if you look, you're literally, when you are riding it, the horse bones are literally trying to go into your ass. If you ride it without a, a, a heavy blanket or something like that. So you need to place a blanket. Now, the thing about the blanket is when you've had a very bad or a very good massage, depending on your point of view, you'll see when they put point pressure on you, it sometimes becomes very painful. And when it becomes painful, they'll put a towel on top of that place and then put point pressure on it. And the towel, even something as simple as a towel, alleviates a lot of the pressure. Why? Because it's spreading the pressure out. Imagine even a th something as a simple as a turkey towel alleviates the pressure so well. Uh, the kind of thicker blankets that they used to use used to alleviate that pressure very significantly. So it somewhat lessens the burden on the horse, but it's still not enough. You still can't get enough armor uh, or protection for uh, this guy on the horse. So he's restricted to skirmishing roles and things like that. He can't really play a major role in battle. Next slide. Okay, now, this is where things get interesting. This is where the invention of the true modern saddle, which happens sometime in about, it gets finessed in about two, 300 uh, uh, AD. I want you to look at the saddle on the right. Can you see the two strips in between? Uh, the dark brown in between. Yeah, that. And you can see the shadow on the other side. Yeah. See what it's done there. It's completely avoided the spine. Where the spine should be, where the spine of the horse should be, it's actually a gaping, long hole in between. Right? 
So what the saddle, this is the structure of the saddle. It, it's not completed yet. This is the construction period of a saddle. What it's done is instead of pressurizing the spine of the horse, it has created two parallel structures which place the entire weight on the back muscles of the horse. What is called the latissimus dorsi. You can see that muscle that we're talking about on the left. And what that further does is because the latissimus dorsi then feeds into the front leg muscles, it first of all, it distributes the weight, takes it away from the spine, which is the most sensitive part, puts it on the rib cage. Second, look at the size. So from uh, if you go back one, back one slide, Look at the image on your right. It was such a point pressure there. Your butt bones directly on the spine bones of the horse. To next slide. To your bones having their entire weight spread across a very significant area. This is about two, three feet. So the pressure, imagine a needle. See a needle when you poke it in like this will go into your skin. But if you place a piece of wood that's quite big and then poke it, it won't go into your skin because that pressure is being spread across a very large area. Right? So it's like bite force or pound per force, depending on how small the thing is. So it's distributing weight. Now, this invention alone allows people to get up armored. You can start wearing armor and all of a sudden the horse can take significantly greater weight because the pressure is eased from its spine to its rib muscles, the back, uh, the back muscles, plus much of it gets diverted to the front shoulder, the front legs. Right. Uh, next thing, please. Next slide. And this is where you have to understand the kind of precision engineering that goes into making the saddle. Now, the top center image here is the perfect saddle. Okay, you can see it fits perfectly. So it's an even fit. And that hole in the center, which you can kind about see, is where the spine keeps going up and down, up and down. So it doesn't interfere with anything. The spine is free to move. But you've got a very solid grip on the horse. And there's no this thing. But you look at the two uh, uh, images below, left and right. You will see how an improperly constructed saddle can lead to pressure points which retard the horse very badly during combat. Okay, so if you look at the uh, bottom left, you'll see that uh, it uh, the pressure points are above and then bottom right, the pressure points are below. So it the entire idea of evenly spreading the pressure is lost because it gets concentrated either too, too high or too low. So this was extreme precision engineering. You literally had to make the map the back of a horse and it wasn't one saddle fits all. You couldn't just take a saddle off a horse and put it. Saddles were made specific to certain horses in those days. Right, because it had to be constructed in a very, very specific way. Like no two humans are the same, no two horses are the same. Right. So this was extreme precision engineering that was involved. Next slide. And this will show you the front view. See if if the uh, uh, hole in between. So if you look at the extreme right. That brown area in the center is where that cavity in between was to allow the spine to move. If it wasn't constructed properly, the spine would keep rubbing up against the arch, which was very problematic again, because you could crack in, in full battle. You could literally crack the spine of the horse doing something, uh, pulling off a stunt when you're jumping, fence jumping and things like that out there. So again, Precision engineering. This was such an important innovation. This automatically increased the weight that a horse could carry by about 50, 60 kilos. Very significant in those days because it means armor. It means you can carry extra weapons. You can carry an extra spear. You can carry lots of extra arrows and things like that. Right. Uh, then the next innovation was the buckle. So next image, please. And here you can see right in front. No, that's the shoe in front. Huh, that, there. 
no, you, you've kept it at the shoe. Take it front a bit to that black patch in front. There. See, that's the buckle. Now, the buckle for the horse was essentially enabled. Before that, the problem was that uh, a ordinary thing like a blanket could not be buckled because it would keep rotating. You yourself would have seen if you wear a, uh, you know, a, uh, 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 what say these, uh, uh, textile fabrics on your hand and things like that, those prayer uh, uh, prayer dhagas and things, they keep rotating around your hand. Right? So it was very... Uh, 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 it didn't fit. Whereas once you get a saddle like this, you can buckle. And once you buckle, your chances of falling are minimal. Because here you've got an absolutely fixed ride on top of the horse. Look at what we're looking at. It's small, small, small innovations like this that have such a huge effect on the way horses go about. So the next inno great innovation was the buckle. Next slide. This is something India can kind of take credit for. And this is the stirrup. Now, if you this is from Sanchi. And if you look just behind that flower, you know that flower at the bottom between the horse's leg, Usse thoda left upar lo. Left. Ah, there. That is a rope. It's a rope with a noose at the end where you just had enough to put a toe. Uh, this is the first known depiction of some kind of a stirrup. It didn't actually uh, revolutionize technology, but it's the first depiction we have of a stirrup. The earliest stirrup we have, if you go up, next slide. This is a proper stirrup. Now, this is very, very important because in terms of mounting the horse, it makes mounting the horse easier. You didn't need to have a helper with you who would help you push up the horse. Second, what it does is it gives you another way of controlling the horse that instead of controlling the horse with this, you can kick the horse on the left. It frees up the entire thigh action. You're no longer holding on to the horse with your thigh. Because with the saddle, you were still holding on to the horse with your thigh. Right? So this frees up your thigh. It leaves your legs free to control the horse, kind of control the horse. You can't get control it with the same precision as with your hand. But you can also, you can kind of control the horse by kicking it left, right or whatever. Uh, you had spurs for that to do that. <coughs> and the other important thing is it also leads to a very, very significant rise in the level of uh, 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 weight that the horse can carry. Because this is like a, if you come to the next slide, it's like a handbag. Now, if this lady was carrying the same amount of weight on her hand, the hand would tire out much easier, much quicker than when she's carrying it slung down because of the way pressure works, right? Uh, same with the backpacker on the right. Why is he able to carry that heavy load on his back? Because it's slung downwards pressure. It, it isn't on your shoulder. It is actually somewhere else. And it is significantly ameliorated by the fact that you have these cushioned uh, uh, straps, which are the only real weight you're feeling. So if you go back to the previous slide, Kushal, So now understand what a significant thing this stirrup is. It's done so much for you. Up to this point, for almost 1,800 years, you needed to use your thighs to hold on for dear life to the horse. You no longer need to do that. Now, if 80% is the reduction from manual to automatic because of one little clutch changing, can you imagine the cumulative effect of all these changes I have told you? the saddle, the buckle, the stirrup, and all of that, the weights have increased massively. Uh, the uh, ability to focus on the battle has increased massively because the stirrup plus the saddle plus the buckle all together have helped you essentially to focus entirely on just your weaponry. You just have to see where the horse is going, but after that, it's just the weaponry. You can focus on your lance, and on your spear, and on your arrows and things like that. 
huge, huge, huge improvement. This happens very, very rapidly from Central Asia to the uh, uh, West. It takes a lot longer to come into India. We don't know why. Uh, generally, technology takes seems to take much, much, much longer to come into India than it moves from East to West. Uh, again, we can't really say why, but it's just what it is. Now, uh, so remember, these are the technologies and the stirrup is the last technology to be uh, uh, innovated for the horse. And this happens sometime around 600 to 700 AD. This is when you can conclusively say stirrups happen. Now, if you remember the picture of the uh, Persian Shahin Shah Take Bostan, he did not have stirrups. He ruled between 550 to 610, 620 AD. But by 700 AD, we start seeing all these stirrups happening. Okay. Now, 700 AD, remember, this is, again, contrast this with 1192 AD, 700 AD, yeh sab changes ho chuke hai. So, stirrup, all the technologies have solidified by about 700, 800 AD. And that gets combined with the size of the horse increase between 1100 to 1200 uh, AD with the size of the horse. Now, we go on to the economics and the ge first the geography. First, you need to understand the geography of horses so this this is a topographic map of the world now the problem is i didn't find an internet tool that would allow me to overlay the biomes with the uh, 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 topographic maps of the world so keep this at the back of your mind that you look at india where india stands in this and look at the way the mountains are all around in east and central asia and west asia as well now you come to the next map Okay, this is a topographic map of the Eastern Steppe. Okay, now you look at that big area that's uh, uh, between Tibet and, uh, can you point that Kushal, north of Tibet? Where's your mouse? I can't see the mouse click. Huh. Come down a bit, come down a bit. You have to shake it around so that I can see it. I can't see the mouse. I can't see it at all. It's okay. You go ahead. The mouse might uh, might be uh, going on and off due to the settings. It's okay. You okay. go ahead. Now, you see... Okay. Now, if you look... If, if you see Japan on your right and just keep going uh, west, 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 you see Korea, which is quite mountainous. Then you see a slight gap. And after that, there's this huge swath of territory all the way from uh, eastern uh, Mongolia right up to the Taklamakan Desert that is pretty much flat out there. Right. Now, the eastern part of this is the Great Eastern Steppe. Okay. Now, this is the Great Eastern Steppe. Now, understand what is happening out here. It is grassland and it is overwhelmingly flat. Flat in the sense, not exact flat, absolute 180 degree flat, but it's very undulating. You know, it's it's very easy to get across. It's not uh, tough terrain to move across and things like that. And it's almost contiguous right into the desert. Now, this is where everything happens. And this is a particularly important area because this is, there are two things happening out here. One is if you look at the gap on the north, that is where cold Arctic winds are coming in. If you remember in the very first slide, there was that Mongol in front of a horse taken in the Oymyakon region. All the cold winds from the Oymyakon are coming here, which is one of the main reasons for the westward migrations that you see. Because this area used to get so damn cold, it wasn't even fun. So climate change used to have a disproportionate effect here and you'd move. Plus... This was extremely fertile area. So it is flat. It is climate change prone, which means severe winds, uh, severely cold win uh, winters and winds. And uh, you would have this uh, 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 whole, um, uh, this uh, extremely lush green grass. Okay. Uh, next slide.
This is the topographic map of Persia. Now you can see in Persia, there is a green patch right at the bottom. Uh, per Persia, may not Arabia. You've gone to Arabia. That is Arabia, Persia. We're just talking about Persia. So can you see the uh, green oval? The green oval in the between the two mountains. Uh, Kushal, bring you're at the Caspian Sea. Huh? That that one exactly. So that oval there, that is one big fertile plain area. Well, semi-fertile plain area. Then if you take it slightly to the right, there's in Afghanistan, there's another big flat plain area. That's northern Balochistan and southern Afghanistan, the Herat, south of the Herat area. That's another big plain area that's reasonably flat, right? Then take it slightly up, up, slightly up. No, 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 not that far up. Down, down, down a bit. Left, left. Left. A bit more left. There. See, this is another plain area. So these are the three big plains areas in Persia that were used for horse growing. Except the oval that we talk about uh, first, the bottommost oval, that was the uh, where the salt desert was. So it, you couldn't really use it for too much uh, 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 horse growing. So it was basically restricted to the Herat, the uh, uh, Afghan growing areas and the uh, 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 the northern, the southern Caspian uh, growing areas. But if you take the same arrow up to where it says Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan on the top right corner, you see that is almost entirely flat. Right? But they still could not grow horses in number out here. I'll show you why. Uh, next, uh, 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 next slide, please. So, you know, you have the classic division of Iran and Turan. Iran is south, what is called Persia. Turan is Persianized Central Asia. So Iran, Turan, this thing. You can see this is the topographic layout. It's almost entirely flat. So it's perfect for rearing horses. Right, because they can run. They are flight animals. They need to run. And I'll show you this in pictures of forests, what kind of forests horses need and why. Uh, they can run. And yet again, even this area is not suitable for growing too many horses. You can still grow a heck of a lot of horses out here between Persia and Central Asia, but not enough. Let's come south. And this is very, very important because in addition to topography, if you come to the next slide, the biomes, you see that these are the biomes. Now, why is it that Central Asia, you see between the Caspian and the Aral Sea, there's a big red patch, which is desert. Right? Between the Caspian and the Aral. You need to take your this thing there, Baba, your mouse. My mouse that is going red. bonkers. I know my mouse is going bonkers. <laughs> okay, so 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 basically, if you look up from India, there's two red patches: one long red patch on your right, and one round, well, ovalish uh, uh, red patch on your left. So that left area is where the uh, this thing is. <coughs> there are two deserts out there: the Karakum and the Kizilkum. The Karakum is the black desert. The Kizilkum is the red desert, bone dry. Bone dry. If you go to my Twitter, I have pictures both in the Karakum and the Kizilkum. Uh, 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 they, they they are some of the driest uh, environments I've ever seen in my life. Now, if you actually look at the rest of this, that light pink marking all around, that is grassland. Now, the problem is not all of this grassland is usable for horses because you have to superimpose this with those topographic maps that I showed you before. So even if it shows grassland, it is not actually usable grassland. It may be mountainous grassland, in which case there's no point. I mean, you can't uh, have horses in mountains pretty much. You can have goats in mountains because goats are brilliant climbers, but horses can't climb if their lives depended on it. Right. They're not meant for that. They're meant for running long distances. So it doesn't work. Now, the most interesting thing I want you to note is India. The Basically, the horse growing areas are light pink, technically, topography allowing for it. Now, you look at India, you see what a 
tiny patch is light pink. Can you see where the mouse is between the red and the yellow, this thing? That tiny little patch exactly there. That is the area from the Katiawar Peninsula through Mewar and Marwar. That is the only area you have where you can grow horses in India. Okay, now if you'd seen a topographic map of India, you'll say, Are ye takla kya bakwas kar raha hai? The entire Indo Gangetic plain is flat. It is flat, but it is forested, boss. No king was willing to give up agriculture and deforest that entire area to turn it into a grassland. Because agriculture was your source of wealth. Okay, forests are a source of wealth. So nobody was willing to deforest. So this grassland area, that thin pink patch. So in the whole of India, only that thin pink patch is both topographically and biologically suitable for, sorry, ecologically suitable for horses. Remember that, that tiny little patch out there. Okay. Now, if you come to the next slide, and it's very important that you understand that why, uh, th th that there are two most famous Indian breeds of horses. They are called the, uh, well, undivided India may three, the Baluchi, which was uh, that Herat depression that I showed you, which was North Baluchistan, uh, the Katyavadi horse and the uh, Mewati uh, horse, uh, the Marwad, uh, 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 Mewad and Marwad horses, right? They are exactly from these areas that I've shown you in these last three, four slides. Now, this is why you can't grow horses. You look in the top left. That is the eastern step, which is to say northern China, northeastern China. You look at the grass there. It's very, very, uh, there is high precipitation out there. Trees don't grow there because of strong winds coming in from the Arctic that I told you about, which is that uh, the Tuva Gap. It's called the Tuva, uh, sorry, the Sakha Gap, where Oimekon and Yakutsk are. And it, it just channels negative 60 degree uh, winds down there. So you can't really have... Uh, 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 trees growing out there. So it is grass out there. Massive millions of square kilometers of just grassland. You can grow a lot of horses out here. This is the eastern step. On your top right is the western step. There's grass growing there. So if you look at that image, it's actually full of grass, but it's extremely dry. Now look at the uh, 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 landscape. It is flat. It is perfect for horses to run around in. They are flight animals. So, you know, like you only get zebras in the uh, savannas of Africa. You don't get it in the rainforests of Africa. Zebras are strictly in the savanna region. This is the uh, 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 this, this is the uh, uh, temperate version of a savanna, of an African tropical savanna. But look on the right. This is the uh, uh, Kazakh. It's the southern Kazakh, northern Uzbek steppe just north of the uh, Kizilkum, uh, uh, or is it Karakum? Well, one of those two deserts. It's much drier. It's much, much drier. So first of all, the sustaining value of it is significantly less. Right? And at the bottom, I want you to look at, this is an image of Gir. Gir is located in the Katyabad Peninsula. Hmm. You can't have horses grow in this kind of region. If there's trees and shrubs like this, you can see it's completely flat land. Technically, if you chopped off all the trees, it would look exactly like the top two pictures do. do. But because of the shrubbery and things, you just can't have horses growing out here. It's impossible. Right? It, it, it isn't a uh, environment suited for the horse at all. Now, isn't it interesting that the horses found during the Harappa period are also found in this, uh, in the previous, the biome chart I showed you, that slender, the Lothal Kalibangan area, you know, from the Katiawar Peninsula upwards kind of area, that you're getting whatever horses were there in the Harappa period. In this particular area, you see most of Katiawar, in fact, you cannot grow horses because it is shrubland like this. Okay. Now I need you to, uh, now there is the difference. Now, top left me, you saw why the Eastern step, because it is so fertile, produces so many horses. I'll give you an example of that later. Now, the Western step, this is the far Northern Western step. 
If you come to the southern western step, which is where most of the invasions of India happened from, it is absolute desert. There's the Khwarezm uh, oasis, there is the Bukhara oasis, and there's the Samarkand oasis, and then there's the Fargana Valley. Now, these are the four main horse growing regions of the Turan area. And I'm going to show you in satellite maps next what they look like. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so now you can see the leftmost painting, the Aral Sea is almost dry now, like the Soviets destroyed it, like they destroyed everything else. Communism kills, uh, remember that. Uh, uh, so you see where it says Chorism, that's Khwarezm. That entire oasis there is the Khwarezm oasis. It's fed by the Amudarya River, which used to go into the Aral Sea. But now, of course, the Aral Sea has been destroyed, thanks to the Soviets. But look at the size of the Khwarezm oasis. Now, this was a very important horse raising area. Why? Because even if it didn't have grass like the Mongolian steppes, the uh, northern Chinese or eastern Mongolian steppes did, it had a huge amount of flat land. You look at all the land around it. It is completely flat. It was perfect for horses to run around in. And it was such a rich oasis as an agriculturally rich oasis that they produced enough grass and hay and, you know, wheat, wheat, ka jo, wheat, you're only using the seed. The rest of it you're giving to the horse to eat. So it was an agriculturally rich oasis, which could, because of the sheer size, more important, food is very important, of course, but more important than that for a combat horse for horses to be used in combat for horses, period. You need huge tracts of land to run around. That is what actually makes a horse. It is the running, the exercise that makes the horse, makes it fit for war. And this, you'll see the amount of area available for it to run around and it had to keep coming back to eat. So they would control the food resources and the horses had to come back to get their food. So it worked out very perfectly for these guys. The one in between is the Bukhara oasis. Again, you can see the same uh, pattern with the Bukhara oasis. A lush patch of green and flat lands, completely arid but flat lands. So the horses can run, they come back, in, they eat in the morning, they come back in the evening uh, for their food kind of thing. So you can maintain a large footprint of horses out here. And the rightmost is the Samarkand oasis. It is the longest and biggest of the, uh, well, it is the longest, but it is not the biggest oasis. Technically, Khwarezm is bigger than the Bukhara and Samarkand oasis put together, which is why Khwarezm always for during the Middle Ages managed to defeat Bukhara and Samarkand. If you controlled Khwarezm, in a sense, you controlled that entire region because you had more horses than Persia. You had more horses than uh, Bukhara and you had more horses than Samarkand, right? Which shows you why if you have more horses, the better for you if you're using cavalry tactics. There, there are very good ways of defeating horses, which I'll come to later. And this is where caste plays a very important role. Uh, next slide, please. Ab isme dekho. I am giving you the equivalent. This is the exact two scale almost to scale that I've taken of Uzbekistan and India of Google Maps. Now I want you to look at the Khwarezm Oasis. Top left me, you can see the Khwarezm Oasis. Top left photo, top left corner. Can you see that huge patch of green in the middle of the desert? That is your Khwarezm Oasis. In the center of that photo, the round blob, roundish blob, that is your Bukhara Oasis. On your right, on right of the blob is your Samarkand oasis. Long thing under that blue lake there. And the extreme right, if you look, it looks like a kind of eye in the middle of the desert. Can you take your mouse there? In the middle of the mountains, extreme right. Where Tashkent, Tashkent likha hai na? Tashkent se bottom right, uh, Tashkent se thoda niche lo aur uske baad right. I can't see your mouse. I ha 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 exactly, slightly below, slightly uh, yeah, that green patch below. Uh -huh. So that green round patch there, if you can just keep moving it around that green round patch, utna dur nahi baba, you've come too far down. Go up, go up, 
the mouse is too far down left slightly left too far left baba ha huh. now where it is can you see that oval that green oval out there that is your fargana valley where babar came from got it right now you have these three massive uh, four massive oases of which khwarazm is much bigger than the other three put together which produce horses they are perfectly suited for horses and now you look down below at india where most of your kathiawad is actually not uh, it is only northern kathiawad which is meant to be good for growing horses and a little part of and this is to scale so the actual growing area of horses in india is roughly equivalent to the size of just the samarkand oasis no more because the whole of kathiawad you can't grow horses like because you saw southern kathiawad is gir uh, forest i showed you what a gir forest looks like and there's mountains in the whole of kathiawad as well so it's only where the kutch starts where the ran of kutch starts kind of east of that that you can see uh, basically i'll show you in the next few slides that is where horses are grown it is no bigger than the samarkand oasis uh, 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 i just want you to run your mouse around the samarkand oasis for the audience please and then for them to extrapolate it ha huh? usse ha huh? the samarkand oasis there exactly that that oasis the long uh, strip oasis there and the uh, uh, marwad mewad and uh, northern kathiawad region it is a tiny horse growing area that you have in india okay and on your right the right photo is of uh, alexander uh, mm -hmm. now you will see three depressions out there where you see hungary written on the top left that is those are the pannonian plains the hungarian plains that is a big rich lush green plain which was out of bounds to alexander's army alexander never conquered that area he probably procured a few horses from there nothing more so that area can actually support a lot of horses the other area that can support a lot of horses is under romania you can see there's a depression out there under romania where romania is written there's a big depression out there that is the southern part of the pontic steppes where it comes into bulgaria right but bulgaria proper is the area called thrace and thrace is where all of greece's horses were grown now you know when alexander sets off on his campaign against the persian empire Or there's actually a smaller uh, uh, plain uh, as well in Macedonia, which is to the left of where Bulgaria is marked. Uh, they grew a few horses there, not too many. It can't sustain too many. But remember, all three of these depressions, these flatlands, they are lush. So the number of horses they can grow are significantly more than, say, Central Asia. But they still had limitations because Alexander only had access to the uh thracian plains which is where you see bulgaria below uh you know how many horses he took when he invaded the persian empire i have no clue 1800 hmm that's 1800 horses that's all he took yeah that's why you i was thinking this. that's so little yeah you see all these ridiculous numbers 20000 cavalry 30000 cavalry absolute bullshit he took 1800 1800 is the maximum number we have the lowest uh, written and this is historically written by the way this isn't a guesstimate it's a, it mm -hmm. isn't an archaeologically based estimate uh, the lowest estimate is 1200 horses now 1200 to 1800 horses remember it is not one horse per person one mm -hmm. person usually owns two to three horses because he goes he charges now a horse can only go up to 20 kilometers a day it can charge full speed for only up to 3 2 to 3 miles a day so that's about 3 to 4 5 kilometers that's it after basically after 4 kilometers it will be completely exhausted at that kind of speed so what they would have to do is they would charge 
then they would come back rest that horse mount the second horse go for a charge come back rest that horse use the third horse by that time the first horse would have rested and then you would climb onto the first horse again so you only had three mounts maximum usually it was two uh, if you were a particularly rich lord and you could maintain a good this thing it would be three horses so basically alexander when he sets out best case estimate is that he has about 900 cavalry allowing for two horses per person some would have had three so it would have actually been less than 900 but the best estimate would be 900 cavalry men when he sets out to invade persia very very important these numbers they're highly overbloated so when they tell you 20 30000 cavalry it's impossible it it's a physical impossibility so when megasthenes is in his indica writes that uh, the magadhan empire had 30000 cavalry your uh, immediate uh, counter to him should be abe bhosri ke kahan se Yeah, okay, because archaeological because, finds में भी कुछ मिलता नहीं है कुछ मिलता नहीं है There's a reason for it, right? This is I'm telling you. It's the geographical. They just say climatic reason. Ke wajay se I'm explaining what the climatic reason is: the topography and uh, uh, the uh, biology and all of that. If you come to the next uh, slide, okay, this is very important. This is the Mewar, uh, Marwar, and Katiawar region. So you see in the top left where it says the Gujarat plains. that is the only part of northern katiawar where the horses can grow even there at places it's so dry because there are very few to no oases out there if you've actually been there you know what i'm talking about it is a incredibly dry desert oases yeah. are non existent in this part and the uh, uh, western part of this is the great ran of kutch so uh, you know absolutely no chance of oasis out there at best you'll get one or two shrubs somewhere in the middle of the desert theek hai na the kind the size of the khwarezm oasis the bokhara oasis the samarkand oasis is a bilkul nahi hai theek hai na so as it is you're looking at short lands to grow in if you look at on your right you'll see that mewar to katiawar patch mewar marwar katiawar patch that green patch that you see ha from north uh, from northern gujarat and into that little peninsula jutting into the hills uh, below jaisalmer theek hai it's better marked in the topographic mar- map below of rajasthan you see that big deep blue patch at the bottom just on the left of the red yeah that is the horse growing area bas okay very small also remember because it is such a sparse area the same area in europe or the eastern steppes that is to say northern china can produce many many more horses than you can with this kind of aridity khwarezm and samarkand khwarezm is anyway much bigger but samarkand th- this area that you're talking about is the size of the samarkand oasis can still produce more horses than this area can why because it is a a uh, much more fertile area than this particular area is so you mm-hmm. see how few options you have for cavalry out here it's mm-hmm. little to non existent almost at most you could sustain around outwards of 2 to 3000 horses in the whole of india because this was the only area capable of in india of actually sustaining horses so your horse production capability is about 2000 horses and i am exaggerating because the quality of the feed here is so low uh you probably couldn't even maintain that much now i want you to go back to slide number uh oh hang on where was this uh to the biome slide slide number 22 please where the you peninsula it's mostly a huge patch of red except south uh where uh yaman is can you point your uh this thing there where mecca medina and say? yaman are mecca medina uh, sorry, and yaman uh, mecca medina C- can you see that southern yeah. part where it's pink So that is the yeah. primary horse growing areas of Arabia. 
Mm-hmm. Most of it is mountain, but the coastal plains there were grasslands. Even that narrow mm-hmm. coastal grassland, because remember, like I said, it's pink. It shows you pink. That particular patch of southern Arabia shows you pink, but it's actually mm-hmm. mountains out there. Most of it is mountains, but mm-hmm. even that patch of land is very fertile. and it is much bigger than the indian horse growing area hmm much much bigger okay so all of these areas fundamentally could grow many many times the number of horses india ever could geographically speaking hmm okay uh so remember all of this and if we come to slide 27 now that's the one i wanted to show you the relative sizes of these uh ha iske baad 27 you were after this one i want you to see the relative sizes of these things you can see the khwarazm depression right the khwarazm uh, <coughs> uh uh this thing yeah that is your khwarazm oasis massive uh where it says middle asian corridor in black just north of that you can see the tiny bokhara oasis with that little white dot marked out there and where where it says corridor corridor actually cuts through the samarkand oasis and on the right where there's that tongue ke shape ki thing where it says uh, inner asian mountain no not that one below that below that 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 tongue the narrow tongue that is your fargana valley so remember even these cumulatively were much better horse producing regions than your entire country had next thing please so this is the economics of it essentially alexander with 1800 horses could have between 600 to 900 cavalry men if you look at europe the map the topographic map that i showed you <coughs> Pannonia plus Thrace plus Bulgaria were infinitely bigger than Kathiawar and Mewar. Even though on a map they look the same size, in terms of actual production, because of the uh, vegetation factors and things I've told you, they could produce fifty to sixty times the amount of horses that Kathiawar and Mewar could. Fifty to sixty times. Okay. and the oases in uh uh, uh khwarazmia that i uh, in turan that i showed you just in the previous slide they could produce anywhere between 20 to 30 times the horses from the same amount of land because of the aridity and food growth uh, uh factors right mm-hmm. now you also need to understand this makes the horse bloody expensive because it needs so much real estate to run around in it costs each horse cost between 10 to 60 soldiers dependent on the terrain mm-hmm. now here's the thing for a mongol coming from the eastern steppe i have seen one calculation that says a horse was worth five human beings as low as that mm-hmm. okay but a horse was always more expensive than a human being much more expensive than a human being in india that's exact same horse to maintain would take up the land and food growth area in the kathiawar mewar uh, marwar belt of up to 60 people so see it's mm-hmm. a sheer ca- case of economics you tell me one king in india that would have depopulated a whole area just to grow horses mm-hmm. not going to happen boss simply yeah. not going to happen okay so there were all these factors now very interestingly because the western step and i've shown you the vegetation differences between the western and the eastern step the eastern step in bulgaria and thrace were so rich of course uh, remember the western uh, the uh, bulgaria thrace and pannonia also had much higher population in the medieval period uh, so you didn't have a high horse to human ratio the turks could only have between 2 to 3 mounts per cavalry man that is to say each man had up to 2 to 3 horses same as alexander this is where the mongols were genius because of how fertile the eastern step was 
Mongols had seven to ten horses per cavalryman. Each cavalryman had between seven to ten horses, and you'll see why this is important. Uh, this is just some basic statistics. Like I said, at a full gallop, it can gallop about three miles. A modern horse race is about two miles. So you look at the Melbourne Cup of the Royal Ascot uh, Derby. It's uh, uh, the Epsom Derby. Uh, it's uh, it's a three mile. Uh, it's a two mile course. So two miles is where you see the horse running at full speed. Uh, after that, it can't maintain that speed, right? So it's it's a short burst of speed kind of animal. Mm -hmm. The next thing is the increase in size of the horses means that that ratio I've told you about a horse being 10 to 60, it actually becomes worse and worse the bigger the horse grows. Mm -hmm. So the bigger the horse, the more food it requires. And like I showed you in one of the first few slides, from the original horse to the modern horse, it's like a factor almost two to three times bigger, even though it's only grown by about three, four feet in overall size. It's almost two to three times bigger than the horse. It requires two to three times more feed. Right. Mm -hmm. So the expenses keep increasing. The next issue is training, because remember, you need a lot of space for training horses as well. And the soldier needs to be the cavalry man needs to be trained up. Now, when he's born as a herder in the steppe, herding goats and sheep across vast lands, riding horses, he doesn't need extra training. That is his life. Mm. Goat management is his goat or sheep management is his life. Here, mm. Akshatriya had to manage his estates and things like that. He needed to learn to write and things like that. In addition to that, he had to learn how to ride a horse and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that fellow was practicing full time. You were practicing part time. And you had lots of other duties and responsibilities as well. Whereas for him, his life was his war. For you, the war mm -hmm. was the aberration of the normal. Mm -hmm. So for him, the horse was an extension of who he is. Yep. For you, it never was. Okay. So very important things. Keep this at the back of your mind. Uh, so this is the uh, why horses are impossible to. Uh, and there's more reasons why they're impossible to grow in India. I'll uh, explain that later. The next was tactics. Now, first to understand cavalry tactics, you need to understand infantry. I've shown you the two formations that were the most important of the time. Uh, the left is the Rom Roman Tortuga, the turtle formation. And on the right is the Macedonian phalanx. Now, all infantry formations, in fact, going right up to 2000 BC, we have a famous Sumerian uh, uh, image of a turtle formation exactly like this. So even 2000 years before this Rom Roman turtle formation, there was a uh, 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 Sumerian turtle formation complete with shields on top to protect you from arrows coming in mm. and arrows and spears coming in from the front. Now, on the right is your phalanx. In the left, what happens is, in the turtle, what happens is, it's pure stampede dynamics. You hold the line and two lines keep pushing against each other. The frontmost soldiers, they keep getting crushed just exactly what happens in a stampede, in fact. So, mm -hmm. you know, unlike what you see that each person was fighting individually with their sword, it never happened that way. If, if it came to that, that means the army was already defeated. If their line broke, think of it as kabaddi in that sense. The line could never break. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what used to happen here was it was basically pushing shield to shield. And they used to use their swords and things from the little holes you see on the top and in between. They would just stick out their spears or their swords and try to jab you to relieve the pressure on them. Their life mm -hmm. depended on it. Because they were being crushed by their compatriots from the back. Why? Because the crush from the front was so much. So to maintain the line, you had to keep crushing on both sides. If the soldier did not manage to kill you, he would be crushed by his own troops from the back. Mm -hmm. So there was an incentive for you and all you did was you pushed with a sword to uh, nudge and kill and things like that. Now, what is the big weakness you see on the image on the left? Kushan, what do you think? How do you draw weapons if you're holding it with one hand is my question. No, you, can slightly, you can slightly open it up and then jab. Thoda sa aise kholo and jab. But what is uh, the weakness you see? I don't know. It's very hard for me to imagine because I think like a modern person, I I'm not... If you look at the left side of the photo, uh -huh. the soldiers are completely exposed. 
Yeah, I was just thinking, what if somebody comes from behind? What the hell are they going to do then? Exactly. Exactly. So see, in early warfare, this is where cav- cavalry was important. Mounted cavalry with arrows. Because while these guys were facing the other infantry formation head on, the cavalry would come around these guys and start shooting arrows from the side. Wherever they could find a gap, they would shoot arrows. And what would happen was the guys with the spears, they wouldn't actually charge into them like you see in the Return of the King and all of that nonsense in uh, Hobbitsville Mm -hmm. and all that crap. Uh, or in Alexander the movie, or in Gladiator the movie, and all of that. Absolute bloody bullshit. It never Mm -hmm. happened. What they would do was they would never crash, because remember, the horse was worth 20 of these soldiers. Mm -hmm. No man worth his uh, 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 money would just throw a horse onto these soldiers to die, because even if two of them died, the horse was worth about 20 Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm. So they never crashed into infantry like this, like they show in movies. What mm-hmm. they would do is they use their spears to find any kind of... You can see there the holes through which the soldiers are looking. They would try to jab mm-hmm. their spears in through that, hopefully get somebody through it. Mm-hmm. Or they would try to aim for their feet because you can see all their feet are exposed. Or they would try to aim for the side. The reason... Cavalry was mobile. So before mm-hmm. any of these guys could turn their shields around and things like that, they're facing infantry in the front their sides are exposed. Ab aage se protect kare, ya left se protect kare, ya right se protect kare, kya pata? Mm-hmm. So that is what cavalry was used for. Okay. Now this is the reason I took the Roman uh, Tortuga versus the, uh, the not Tortuga, Testudo. Testudo. I kept saying Tortuga, Testudo. Uh, t- turtle formation versus the uh, phalanx on the right, the Macedonian phalanx on the right. Mm-hmm. <coughs> is because these were the two approaches to war. On the left, it was based on stampede dynamics. On the right, it was based on not even allowing you to come close. Because look, at their spears are so long. Long, yeah. You were literally going up against a fence of spears. And then there was a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. It was 20, 20 deep. There were 20 lines of spears. Ultimately, somebody would crush you. So there was no way that you could get very close to these guys. Mm -hmm. So the the right was the porcupine tactic. The left was a different kind of tactic, but basically all the tactics of shields and infantry were based around these two tactics. Mm -hmm. The only way way a horse could defeat the one on the left was to come to the sides. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or get close enough uh, in front and jab through the vision holes that you can see on top or at the feet below. This on the le- on the right hand side with the Macedonian phalanx, cavalry simply could not get close. They yeah, had they to would go just around the them side. away. Yeah, exactly. They they had to go from the sides. Now the problem with long spears like this is, it works perfectly when you're attacking from the front. But what happens if you're attacking from the left, right, or the back? You mm-hmm. can't wheel the entire thing around and reorient your spears that way. Got it. Okay. So it was always trying to kill off one, two people in the hope that the line would break. The moment the line broke, that is when the massacre set in. Hmm. So basically, okay. it, uh, the strength was in numbers. The moment you open them up, they're open to attack from multiple sides. Exactly. The infantry strength was in numbers. Horses never attack the way you see in movies, especially not one behind the other. Imagine 10 men, 10 deep, pushing each other at an enemy shield would crush the man up front the most. Tell me what Mm -hmm. happens when a horse slams into your back after you've slammed this thing. The amount of training, the amount of expense that's gone into a horse. You've just killed two infantry guys. Mm -hmm. And then the horse behind you also stumbles because it crashes into you. This horse has Mm -hmm. fallen. This guy has fallen. The horse behind you stumbles into you. It never Mm -hmm. happened that way. They used to work in very thin lines. It was never mass attack. What they do is they go in two different directions. I will try raining arrows or spears on him from the left and from the right. Mm -hmm. It's never frontal like this. Mm -hmm. So forget all those movies you've seen. It was a physical impossibility. It could never ever happen. So cavalry tactics were... 
knocking off it and you know today the army will demonstrate tent pegging for you which is you know there's a tent where the tent is pegged to the ground they will remove that it was accuracy training it was mm-hmm. accuracy training because coming at 20 kilometers per hour with your spear you see that little hole with the soldier pointing out at you you need the precision to knock him Mm-hmm. and so see with the size of inf- of the horse growing and the control you have have it to the saddle through the spear through the uh, sorry the saddle the stirrup the buckle and the everything else mm-hmm. it gives you so much more control to be able to do these things now mm-hmm. theek hai na so very very important in what happened out there uh, so this is how the tactics used to work out next slide please this is your evolution of cavalry armor ha huh. so this is the evolution of cavalry armor now this is the famous bust this is me at the naksher ustam this is where darius xerxes and all these people are buried in persia it's outside of uh, shiraz uh, and this is the very famous frieze at that burial spot of the naksher ustam this is the surrender of roman emperor valerian to emperor the sassanid emperor shapur in 260 ad you look at shapur he's only wearing a chest armor he's wearing nothing else there's no saddle there's no stirrup well there's some kind of saddle but there's no stirrup or anything he's clutching onto the horse see how low his feet are his feet are almost as low as the horses mhm right but look at his yeah. armor he's only wearing yeah. a chest plate and nothing else next mm-hmm. slide who look at the man in the middle yeah so i'm coming there हो गया हां सो ऑन द लेफ्ट इज द तुर्किक हॉर्स आर्चर नो आर्मर एट ऑल बिकॉज़ ही इज डूइंग लॉन्ग डिस्टेंस दिस थिंग लुक एट द एंगल ही इज नॉट पॉइंटिंग अप ही इज पॉइंटिंग स्ट्रेट एवरी टाइम यू लुक एट पिक्चर्स इन मूवीज दे विल शो यू दे फायर एरोस अप इन द एयर एंड इट कम्स डाउन एंड हिट्स पीपल या एब्सोल्यूट रबिश इट कुड नेवर हैपन बिकॉज़ यू होल्ड योर शील्ड्स ऑन टॉप the kinetic energy of a projectile coming down just isn't strong enough to get through the shield so it had to be direct energy you fire a mm-hmm. direct shot hona tha indirect fire nahi hota tha it had to be mm-hmm. direct fire same reason in kargil for example because indirect fire by howitzers wasn't working they had to drag the howitzers up so that they would fire direct at 90 degrees to the thing so that there would be massive kinetic impact mm-hmm. right so look at the angle at which he's holding it this is a uh, horse archer on your center is the armored cavalry mm-hmm. which comes in around th- this is because of the strengthening of the horse but notice yeah. again he's wearing chain mail armor which is very light mm-hmm. and the uh, 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 horse is wearing fish scale armor which is again very light you know what is interesting about this is how valuable the horse is that it gets so much protection exactly and remember fish scale armor costs more and is more expensive to make than chain mail armor yeah and, and this so is very was you know because of the fact that they could spear the horse so they need this protection for the horse right exactly theek hai na so the horse is more important than the guy riding it that's yeah. the amusing part of it yeah. yeah and on the right again you're seeing that uh, uh, how the horse is armored but the emperor is also armored and the uh, emperor is full fully armored now to defeat a horse was actually really easy it wasn't yeah. rocket science yeah. mm-hmm. it happened the ahomias did it the odias did it uh, the battle of hastings initially when the saxons were winning they did it at the battle of agincourt and crecy the french uh, the english longbow men did it so come to the next slide so these were the two ways of defeating cavalry one is you place all your archers behind the stakes these stakes mean that the uh, horses just can't jump they get impaled on these things so it's like uh-huh. mobile armor you literally each guy carries a stake you just plug it into the uh, ground and that's it it's an impenetrable shield the horse can't uh, pass it what happened yeah. at the battle of hastings and what happened in ahom was that they broke discipline and went out of these stakes they went outside the stake wall to chase the enemy and that is when they were cut down mm-hmm. right on the right is something called a caltrop this was the landmine of ancient warfare you mm-hmm. just uh, 
sp uh, spray it around the battlefield, the horse, its feet, poor thing, it gets stuck in this. It yeah. goes right through the horse's yeah. foot. Yeah, and right? it will fall so down. So actually, dealing with cavalry was very simple. The reason a lot of people didn't do this was because they wanted the flexibility to go out. Because what can go through a horse's foot can go much deeper into a human foot. Mm -hmm. So they always wanted the flexibility to go out and, you know, uh, go out of their defensive areas, which is where most of the defeats happened. You look at the Battle of Tarain, it's a classic case of this. Now, even at Tarain, it's very interesting what happens, but that's probably not to be covered here. So next, uh, this thing, please. So like we've discussed, infantry was basically based on either stampede principles or not coming close. Cavalry was the opposite. It was thin lines and it was not direct attack. Because you, if you used arch, like this kind of attacks, like missile kind of attacks, it wasn't going to pierce anybody's armor. So it had to be direct shooting like this, but it had to be from a side. It wasn't where the shield was. It was on the sides or precision targeting kind of thing. So it was primarily flanking and skirmishing, never a direct charge. Very important factor. How much iron could you rain down on your enemy? Now, they did a chariot reconstruction. I can't find that video for some reason, but I think BBC or uh, uh, National Geographic did a uh, reconstruction where they showed one chariot doing six, seven rounds, one Egyptian chariot from about 1100, uh, 1200 BC, Battle of Kadesh between uh, Ramesses and the Hittites, can do about within the space of three to four minutes, carrying two people can unleash about 300 arrows on a person. Now imagine two sets of chariots constantly circling you, one from the left, one from the right, constantly shoving arrows down your uh, e either side. Are you protecting your left? Are you protecting your right? It's just a matter of time before you get hit. It's just sheer probability. So the amount of iron they could rain down on you was very, very important. Mm -hmm. Now combine this with the fact that the Mongols had seven to ten mounts. They could come at you seven to ten times in a day. The Turks could come at you only two or three times a day. Mm. So the amount of iron they could rain down on you was massive. The amount you got irritated by it because it would take its toll. If they're going on coming at you from the side, you keep losing men, keep losing men, keep losing men, and then discipline breaks and then you charge. This is what happened at the Battle of Tarain. Discipline broke, you charged, and that was the end of you. Got it. They used their horse archers to great effect. So even the amount of horses, this is why the number of horses you put into the battlefield is so important. It is not the fact that they can come and crush you like they show in Hollywood. It's the fact that they're harrying you, they're harassing you, they are wearing you down in summer heat with all your armor and things like that. They're shooting at you from the side. They're raining down metal on you left, right, and center. It is only a ma it, it is just a statistical probability that you're going to break after a point of time. Mm -hmm. it? It's as simple as that. It is all economics and statistics. Mm -hmm. Also, very important uh, is uh, the last part of this. Again, both anti-cavalry and pro-cavalry because the armor became so good. These were some of the things you could use. The crossbow, the composite bow, and the re of both. Each one of engineering. If you come to the next slide, I'll show you why. Top right is the crossbow. It has the highest, uh, it has the least amount of training. All you do is you just wind it up. It uh, sort of creates that tension of the leather and you put an arrow there and it fires. The problem is it takes a long time to reload. Each time creating that tension used to take about almost 50, 60 seconds for you to pull it back. Whereas with an ordinary arrow, you're like, psh, psh. Got it. maximum five, seven seconds, you should be able to reload. This used to take about 30 seconds. So it was the easiest to train. Even an untrained warrior could use it. Enormous pound force. Imagine in a single point, it had the same kind of bite force as a more than a crocodile or things. It could easily punch through steel. Mm -hmm. Right? These other bows were much more dangerous. On the left is your composite bow. The two. Mm -hmm. This is what they look like. Mm -hmm. on, uh, left top is when they are strung. 
So, you know, when you see soldiers going around in all these movies with the bow fully strung, they never walked around like that because it destroyed uh-huh. the whole point of the bow. It was always kept in the state that you see below and it was actually wound backwards because that is what created the tension enough for an arrow to punch through armor. Mm-hmm. And the right, you see the demonstration of it. Right bottom, see it's curved one way like a horn on top. It has to be pulled back till it becomes like a inverted katori. Got it. And then look at the tension when it is drawn. That is what gives it that punching strength through steel. Right. So all of these show you that it was never going in an arc. It was going directly. So these were all the infantry methods you had of defeating cavalry. So why did India not defeat cavalry? Right. Really because of caste. These numbers. You look at the accounts of the Peshwa Peshwa kings. Ridiculous. So we're almost at the end now. We started focusing away from infantry, and please do not underestimate what a role caste played in this, because you want to show that you are superior. The dikhava of superiority is so important for you. You are wasting money, especially getting a horse into India, where one horse costs you the same as 60 soldiers, as you have seen. And you need a very specific kind of terrain, which you do not have, which you have to create. So it takes away from other kinds of wealth. It is disproportionately expensive for you to own a horse than it is for a Mongol to own a horse or for a Turk to own a horse. It is cheaper for a Mongol to own a horse than it is for a Turk. It is cheaper for a Turk to own a horse than it is for an Indian. So it... That caste equation added to all the geographical, topographical equations that I showed you uh, above, leading away to infantry. So you're, you you never play to your strength. You play to your weakness because of caste. Because I have to show you. It is like today, uh, ki shadi hai. Uh, my daughter is getting married, so I'm going to destroy myself creating a uh, uh, wait I'm not going to have food left eat after that. So bad economics, then there was a case of bad breeding. I'll come. We, we didn't realize how, how bad breeding affected things till, till uh, much uh, later, till the British came. Because the Marathas tried, the Marathas tried through the, 16, uh, through the 1700s to improve breeding. So the Marathas used to find that they had to keep importing stock from Arabia because the northern reaches were blocked by this time. Uh, They had to import from Arabia and the stocks would get ruined very rapidly. In two generations, that would be the end of the stock. And we still don't know why till the British come because the British introduced a certain scientific temper because this comes with the scientific revolution. Now, next uh, slide, please. The British in 1794, they created a stud department in India. It was literally called the stud department. Okay. Mm -hmm. They shut it down very rapidly because they found that the results achieved were not commensurate with the costs of maintaining the studs. Because remember, by this time, economics had become a science. They understood economics. They understood certain things about breeding and things like that. So this was all this thing. In 1876, they started it up again. It was called the Army Remount and Horse Breeding Department, created by GHB uh, Hallen. His book, I would highly recommend you try to get it and read it. It is a Bible for horse breeding. Mm -hmm. But remember, at this point of time, cavalry tactics were coming to an end and you were shifting from war horses to logistics horses. Uh, They were mostly used for artillery and things like that, uh, for dragging artillery and for dragging uh, trains. And he lists in his book why Indians were continuously failing. The first was the reluctance to castrate horses. Mm -hmm. The weak horses were being allowed to reproduce. And there was this absolute reluctance to castrate a horse amongst Indians. He never understood why. It was a cultural thing. But Muslims or Hindus, they just refused to castrate horses. It became very, very problematic, uh, according to him. Mm -hmm. The next thing was because Indians went used to fencing property. What would happen was the attrition of horses if they roamed around too much was too high. Mm-hmm. Because the horse goes into somebody else's neighborhood and starts eating, it either gets killed or captured or something like that. That's the end of it. TK, you're mm-hmm. destroying my property. And Got because it. of this, what a lot of the landlords used to do was 
they used to padlock the legs or prevent them from running. Now, like we discussed in the earlier things, it is the running that makes the horse. It has to run for 30, 40 kilometers a day in order to become that strong muscular animal or the animals. It's like Abhijit Ayer Mitra trying to fight UFC championship with my kind of flab and my soft pudgy hands that haven't done any exercise in their life. I'm not going anywhere in a fighting competition. You need mm. to go to the gym every day. So running is like that. So they couldn't go to a gym. And you know, running mm. them around in circles is not the same. So, so they found it led to a lot of chest deformities. Because the mm. lack in the first year, two years of the horse, it has to be allowed to run freely. You mm. can't impose restrictions on it. It just needs to run, 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 run. Mm. Then what was happening was, was something called muling. And this points a very important thing to why there is still a debate on if India had the true horse or not. What they found was when they were getting Arabian, English, Australian studs mm -hmm. to refresh the stock. Now, we discussed mm -hmm. how the Maratha stocks, the quality would decline every two, three generations. The British faced the same thing. What they mm -hmm. found was that every time uh, uh, they got foreign stallions as well, what was happening with the same stock? They would improve the stock and suddenly when they got foreign stock, mm -hmm. it would suddenly turn infertile. Mm -hmm. And that is called a mule. A mule is when you mate a horse with a donkey. Uh, it, it is called a mule and it is a sterile animal. It can't A mule can't mate with a mule. Mm -hmm. This is why horse genetics are extremely complicated. And this is why there is so much confusion about the true horse in India, because we still don't know where the genetic lock in the Indian horse is. That every time we've tried to import and refine a breed here, it doesn't seem to yield those results. Mm -hmm. So this actually led the British to give up. So they created an Indian horse, but they just decided it wasn't worth it. And by this time, remember, mechanization and all of that had taken over. So the Got need it. for the Indian horse was pretty much done. But even at, towards the end, they decided the in horses were of such inferior quality, no British officer was meant to use them. Out mm -hmm. of 300 horses, only one was suitable for drawing artillery, heavy artillery. Mm -hmm. And the only use for those horses was for native cavalry. No British mm -hmm. officer was willing to ride one of those horses. Mm -hmm. Got it. Cumulatively, we now understand the only unfinished part of the puzzle is this muling effect. Because that has to be done through a genome study, which, you know, you have to unlock uh, unlock the genome code and study it. But other than that, this is the entire picture of why India could not have the horse and why there is so much doubt of if ancient India actually had the true horse in the first place, precisely because of this muling effect mm -hmm. uh, of the infertility and things like that. So to conclude, and this was Sir John Watson who took over the uh, uh, Army Remount and Horse Breeding Department from Hallen. The endeavor has, has been persevered in for a century, has failed and will fail for we are fighting against nature and nature will beat us in the long run. India was never suited to horses. The moment we tried going for horses, from an economic point of view, we destroyed ourselves. And thanks to caste, we never focused on infantry heavy tactics because you wanted the tamasha of Maharaja will either ride a horse, uh, Maharana Pratap will ride Chetak, or uh, the Maharaja will ride the elephant. With the Khawa show was very important. You destroyed yourself economically. There are so many parallels today with modern day India and the way we purchase technology from outside, it is not even. Okay, so we will end there. All right, cool. Abhijit, let me take, uh, I'm not going to ask you a single question that I had. In fact, I had my own points, but maybe I'll make them in a separate monologue about uh, it all. But I'm going to ask as many questions as I can from our live viewers, because there are a lot of questions. Um, mm, Okay, one see. second. My camera is acting up, so I've cut off my this thing, so I can only hear your audio. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Perfect, perfect, perfect. It's not it's not a big deal. Yeah, you can shut shut the camera off. So let's start. So the Maratha Empire focused on cavalry at their origin. As the empire grew, they began to focus on infantry. That's example is you, uh, one second. Is You're still breaking up. Let me just uh, reboot my internet and come. Huh? Just give me one minute.
I'll just sure. turn off my do modem that. and switch on again. One do second. That. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, guys. So I was looking at your live comments. So a lot of you are confused. So so Abhijit will be back, and uh, when, when when Abhijit is back, we will start taking uh, questions. But before that, I know uh, as all of you, a lot of you are watching this live, and everybody was going through. And the first question that comes to everybody's mind is, what does it say about the Aryan invasion, Aryan migration theory? Is it real, or is the out of India theory too? I can tell you that. the entire evidence that abhijit has provided has nothing to do with aryan invasion and aryan migration and i will explain that in detail what i i guess i will have to do is i will have to do a detailed monologue on the same about all the mentions of the horse uh, uh, whatever we know archaeologically about the horse in india let me tell you absolutely abhijit is 100% right in his entire analysis because when we do an archaeological analysis in india and outside india we barely find the horse in india it is but we barely find it in terms of let's say when you get you know you dig archaeologically outside india you'll have thousands of skull you know bones bone fragments of horses in india it's not the case of a particular horse i'm talking about this horse the war horse then then the thing is oh that means the aryans came from outside no and that is where the chronology of the rigveda and the internal analysis of the rigveda and where do we find the mentions of the horse inside the rigveda matter so which is why i'm saying uh, if i would have been you know if we had the time i would have maybe extended this but i know you guys don't have the patience india you know this is not the joe rogan show but it's okay so we're just going to take the questions so i will deal with them abhijit can you hear me yeah can you hear me yeah okay let's start with the questions now so the first question was the marathas focused on cavalry at the on during their origin as the empire grew they began to focus on infantry let's say in panipat is this a correct assessment and uh, abhijit we'll have to take many questions to keep the answer short so that we can take as many questions as possible uh yeah uh no in fact uh, one of the reasons that uh, you, you know the uh, eastern experiences of maratha rule are particularly nasty Uh, the odias the bengalis don't have a very good opinion of the marathas because of how plunderous and rapine they were and one of the re reasons was the expenditure on cavalry for the maratha uh, military was humongous it always remained a highly mobile force but the cost of that mobility like we discussed was extraordinarily high it destroyed the exchequer in a sense okay and their refusal to go with uh, the adoption of gunpowder very rapidly in europe they adopted gunpowder extraordinarily rapidly in india mm -hmm. it takes 2 300 years after the west for us to start adopting gunpowder in a proper way yep all right so the next is in the recent excavations at sonoli up it uh, they have shown chariots and copper swords being buried with the charioteer and soldiers so that that is of a significant period uh, somebody has said 7000 years old that uh, that is not a right depiction of the date so the sonoli excavations are completely done so just, abhijit i don't know about if you know about this the sonoli excavations are done by dr sk manjul it is under his charge that the entire excavations have happened and even there they claim that they have found the horse chariot the horse bones have not been found but they say the chariot is a horse chariot but it is not a spoked wheel chariot and basically the i think from what i have understood it's a push the date of the it's mahabharata it, it, yeah. it doesn't matter if it's a spoked wheel chariot or not like i told you the very fact that a chariot exists the economics of india don't support it so it was yeah. clearly a prestige item and uh, a true horse or not is a irrelevant debate in this case yeah because even if you had the true horse you didn't have the ability to sustain the true horse theek hai na so i don't know what role this question plays in that presentation i've given you i know i know that's what i was just trying to explain that uh, in fact uh, when you are your internet had cut off you know i was saying that the archaeological evidence and what people don't realize is the internal analysis of the rigveda actually proves everything that you're saying <laughs> actually shows because the horse was revered in the rigveda 
uh, it was revered because it was extremely rare. Uh, I have given umpteen references of the Ramayana many times where I have compared, uh, you know, the 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 punishment uh, in, in equivalence sometimes of killing a horse and killing a cow. And it's always the horse that is far more valuable than the cow. So there is. So so what you're saying makes complete sense. But what, what had happened was uh, you did not hear me because you're off and everybody not that. In my case, whether Aryan invasion is true or false doesn't matter to me, but I just study it as an academic effect. But what people think is horse equal to Aryan invasion. No, horse does not equal to Aryan invasion. And what I'm trying to show here is the yeah. Aryan invasion is completely irrelevant to the horse. Yes, because even if the Aryan invaded, true. even if they invaded, they couldn't have sustained a horse culture here any longer. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. impossible to sustain a horse culture. Full stop impossible so so somebody has asked a very specific question so there was a breed of a horse which survived on the deccan plateau in the 16th to 18th century what they're saying which was helping the marathas in the conquest is this information real and accurate and is it uh, uh, i don't know is there any info about that i it is not a flatland Anybody who's been to the Deccan will see that there's no great stretches of plain flat land that can be used for horse breeding the way I've explained it to you. So I know on a, a map, it looks like it's flat, but it's not. So there's no way you can sustain a horse in that kind of uh, terrain. All right. So this is an interesting question. So somebody says that did the Saraswati River drying up also cause a lot of you know, geological changes in that area. And could that have also led to the lack of horse, uh, the land available for breeding the horses too? No, not really. Because remember, uh, with the Saraswati drying up, right, uh, somewhat reduces the uh, uh, area. But remember, it wasn't grassland before. It was deciduous forest before which again isn't suitable for horses. And after the drying up, uh, in fact, it becomes more suitable for horses. So the reason Kathiawad and Mewad and Marwad become suitable for horses is precisely because of the drying up. Like today, you technically the Gangetic uh, plains are perfect for horses as long as the Ganges died and that entire area dried up. Okay, yep. and killed all the forests around it. So quite the contrary, the drying up actually enabled a horse culture to emerge. Yeah. Okay. So these are Limited, two good questions. Still. Yeah. So this is another good question. I know you mentioned it uh, in your uh, presentation too, but still I'll ask this question. So uh, Akshohini from Mahabharat, where one Akshohini is believed to comprise of 65,610 horses. So obviously that is false, right? Obviously, boss, this is that classic exaggeration. You know, to show numbers, you have to exaggerate. And it isn't unique to India. Almost every yeah. single tradition to show greatness exaggerates. So, for example, Ravana's 10 heads. Do you really think Ravana had 10 heads? No. Mm. It's just to show a great number to awe people into thinking, oh my God, that many. Right? It's, it's a rhetorical device. It is not a real... Uh, all right so this is another question did india have any sort of a military manual like strategicon or tactica like the eastern romans had or any kind of a horse training manual or of. anything of that sort not that we know of because the one thing we know about india is that the passing on of knowledge was atrocious remember we even lost uh, how to read the brahmi script it took the, the british to teach us how to read ashokan inscriptions we had forgotten how to read them because remember, everything was written in palm leaves. Uh, we would mm -hmm. archive, we would store, but then they would rot in about 10, 15 years, depending on humidity. And then the knowledge would be lost. And then retrieval was an impossible process. See, there's no point archiving unless you can retrieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, archiving bhi ghatiya tha, retrieval to non-existent tha. Hmm. Okay, so uh, as, as far as we know, there was, uh, in fact, there is a lot of allegorical examples to suggest that there wasn't. So, for example, the Vijayanagar emperor, one of them, I forget which one, he asks around the mid-1300s, 
why is it that we keep losing to the Muslims? We need to have a Muslim cavalry corps. And uh, he gets a Muslim cavalry corps. But he's never able to decipher why Hindus keep losing to Muslim cavalry or Turkic cavalry in this case. So clearly there was no uh, written military data because look, even the descriptions of battles are non-existent. It's all Muslim descriptions of battles. There are no Hindu descriptions of battles to be handed over. And it's not because, you know, the Muslims came and burnt. They also did a lot of that. But your method of storage, archiving and retrieval itself was bad. Right? Yeah, that uh, was a yeah, huge issue. Yeah, like, like for example, every Mughal king had a Mughal court historian. I just don't get it other than the Raja Tarangini, which is the major historical document that documents the lineage of all the kings from start to the end has ever been done in our culture. For some odd reason, we don't seem to do that. I mean, it's, it's a load of things. It's cultural plus it's, like I said, the basic concept of archiving simply didn't exist. Yeah. So just one last question, which is kind of related to this. So you, you know, in the economics bit, you did talk about, you know, how the, the, the maintaining the horse required a lot of money. It was a very expensive task. So somebody has asked that what was the Etruscan civilization, the best in Europe before the rise of Rome in terms of average standard of living, freedom and liberties. Sorry, which, which civilization? The Etruscan. Not necessarily, not necessarily. Uh, 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 you know, it's it's very difficult to measure uh, 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 living standards before Rome in certain cases. So, for example, with Gaul, we have huge issues measuring living standards because living standards require you to look at public buildings and urban built up areas or built up areas in general, which the Romans completely repurpose. So you're not able to decipher layers beneath them. Uh, you can't really check out Etruscan uh, living standards at that point. So, uh, no, there is no clear example of Etruria being uh, the highest living standard in Europe. I would have probably said if you're looking at continental Europe, it would have been the Minoan civilization in uh, 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 Crete. Uh, which whose living standard was significantly higher than the Mycenaean civilization that ultimately conquered them. But uh, it would have definitely been uh, uh, Minoan, not Etruscan. All right. So this is actually, Abhijit, I'll answer this because I think it's better that I take this one. So somebody has said, sorry in advance if this is stupid. Uh, it's okay. Don't worry. Nothing is stupid. You should ask questions. It's a good thing. So Mahabharata has a lot of mentions of good horses. How does this fit with India not being conducive for horses? His name is Ajinkya. So let me take this one. So Ajinkya, you have to understand. So even when you look at the Mahabharata, the, the premier institute in India, the Bhandarkar Institute, that has all the critical editions of the Mahabharata and has analyzed all the verses of the Mahabharata, or whether it is a Ramayana, try and understand that these texts are not all written in one point of time. There are a, there are a lot of verses, there are interpolations of a later time that are gotten inside the Mahabharata and you get the entire Mahabharata in one version. But it's very hard to understand which verse is from the original Mahabharata or the Ramayana period and which verse is from a later period. So don't be surprised that a lot of times when you're talking about these amazing horses and that, it could be a much later version and that verse gets incorporated and uh, becomes part of the exact new test. Please remember that you will find a lot of cases like that. So do not see this is where, you know, textual literalism is very dangerous. Otherwise, uh, and this, this also applies to the Mughal court historians, by the way. Don't take everything the Mughal court, court historian says literally. Uh, Mughal court historians say, we have killed crores and crores of Indians. Hmm. So please, so, you know, that, 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 that is very important. So this is a good question, Abhijit. I'm going to leave it on the screen too. If horsehead had little practical value for wars, transport, food in ancient India, then why were they a status symbol and venerated? Very good question. Like I explained, one, because they were so expensive. B, look at the, when you're riding a horse, it doesn't matter if it's the short early horse or the tall later horse. It elevates you above the troops. It gives you speed another status symbol. So there is tactical value to it. 
So like I told you, there is tactical value. You look at the uh, uh, the outflanking, the oblique attack. It enables you to attack a lot quicker. Okay, mm -hmm. you can ride like one kilometer throughout at high gallop, going on shooting arrows from angles that people don't expect. So it does have tactical value. Okay, so there is tactical value. It is useful. Uh, just keep flashing that question, please, because it had several layers to it. Sure. Here you go. So it, it did have practical value. The issue is that in India, the economics completely overpowered the practical value. What practical value it brought was not economical in India, mm. which is why it became a status symbol. What value does gold have? Can you eat gold? No. Can, is, does gold make for good armor? No. It, it's very malleable. Does it conduct electricity well? No. Uh, can you wash your ass with it? Uh, wash your ass with it? No. Uh, there's nothing you can realistically do with gold except where it is jewelry. So why is it a status symbol? Precisely because of that, because it is so expensive and it is mm -hmm. pretty damn useless. So in India, that is why it was venerated. Rarity. And rarity, yeah. see, rarity, Indians were still very infantry oriented right up to the high mid middle ages. There is a great synchronization. I'm saying there's correlation, not causation. We still don't know what the causation is. I suspect it is also causation, but correlation between caste rigidity and horse uh, obsession, <coughs> which destroys you. You don't want to fight your strengths. You want to fight your weaknesses, which bankrupt you. So, mm. so, so that is the point. It is this need for status. The more caste gets rigid, the more important it gets. See, the, the uh, Rig Vedics, they venerated it, but they didn't fetishize it. By medieval India, you start fetishizing the horse. And right. the religious Rama, text bear it where out. Have you read it It's, it's just that. I think we've covered all the questions. So just, you know, it's time to wrap it up then, Abhijit. First of all, thank you very much for this. This was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed it. And in fact, uh, here's a promise to all the podcast viewers, listeners. So first of all, this is not going to go in the audio version because you just cannot understand this in an audio version because there are too many images there. So even if I extract an audio and put this out there, you're not going to get what's happening. So I'm going to leave this exclusively for YouTube and the video version. Obviously, you can watch it on, uh, you know, on Facebook and uh, Periscope where, where it has been simultaneously streamed. So this is going to stay there. Also, Abhijit has uh, given me the permission. So with his permission, I'm going to leave, a, you know, a link for Abhijit's presentation itself in the description of the podcast. Uh, so that you can also download it and go through it separately, maybe on your phone while you're listening to this so that you get an even better experience. Because I would recommend you guys to listen to this in, you know, breaks, at least, you know, in two to three sessions. I know we did a long session because everybody does not have the capacity, but this was a lot of fun. Abhijit, buddy, thanks a lot for this. And thanks a lot for coming on the podcast as always. Live long and prosper. Veil, veil, vetri, veil. All right. Okay, guys, time to wrap it up. As always, subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment there. I once again repeat, go through Abhijit's presentation again and again. And this is, okay, do one thing. Whatever questions you have, you know my handle, Twitter handle, and Abhijit's Twitter handle. Send us those questions on Twitter. What I'll do is, Abhijit and I will collect those questions together and maybe in the future if there are any questions that we need to clarify we will clarify all those questions in the future too I'll leave you guys for the day please support the Charvak podcast by becoming a member on YouTube or subscribing on Patreon or sending your donations or UPI or buying the merch via kushalmera.com or katakmerch.com I'll see you guys next time until then 